to Exodus 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. Then going forward um, to Matthew 6, 25 to 34 on page 971. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more, than, much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how, the, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Great, if you could please keep your Bibles open and let me pray for us now. Father, as we come to your word together, we are conscious that we need your help. And we confess that so often we are more interested in serving ourselves than other people. We confess that so often we fail to trust that you will really protect us. And we pray that you would help us this morning to see more of the glory of Jesus uh, that we might be like him and live the kind of lives that you call us to live we pray you would work in us by your spirit now for Jesus sake amen one of the traditions that we have created as a family is for me to take one child when they're about seven or eight years old on a camping trip to climb Mount Snowdon. It's become something of a rite of passage, an important moment for each child. It's happened twice, two more to go. And we've also done it as a whole family on a sweltering day in August. And the thing about climbing a mountain is that it is a game of two halves. The first half is the hard grind, an uphill struggle all the way. The weather is hot, the conditions challenging, or if you have a child on your back, it takes significant effort. But then there's the moment when you get to the top, and although you're literally only halfway, when it comes to energy output, well, it's much more like three quarters, at least, you've done the hard part. And so, when you get there, you can sit down, breathe a sigh of relief, and relax. Well, I wonder if that's how you feel as we come to the Eighth Commandment. We have covered the hard graft. Honouring parents, that's hard. Obedience in youth, respect in adulthood, care in old age. Murder and the painful issues of abortion, euthanasia, suicide, anger. Adultery and sex, marriage, lust, fidelity, chastity. These topics have been heavy, painful, exposing, and far-reaching. But today, you shall not steal. Finally, a commandment that we can obey. There was a survey done once of a group of Christians about the Ten Commandments. In it, 86% claimed to have completely satisfied God's requirement in the Eighth Commandment. And I wonder if you feel the same way this morning. We might say, well, I've not shoplifted, burgled, or committed fraud. I'm not a thief, 
This commandment really is about other people. I can relax. We can probably guess what I'm going to say next. Now, the you shall not steal commandment, actually, like with all of these commandments, is just the tip of the iceberg. There is more to this command than meets the eye. Because under the surface, we're actually thinking about our attitude towards possessions, money, people, God, faith, contentment, generosity, work, community. And suddenly we find, hmm, there's actually quite a lot to be thinking about here. Like with all these commandments, they, this is a window into God's character, a mirror to our hearts, a signpost pointing to our desperate need for Jesus and his death for sinners, and a light showing us how to live. What do we learn in the Eighth Commandment? And we're going to see three things. Here's the first. Personal property matters. Now, this idea becomes very clear in the following chapters in Exodus. Chapters 21 to 23 describe the many ways in which the Ten Commandments were to be applied in Israelite life. And in chapter 22, there are a number of laws about personal property. They're not kind of riveting reading, but they're quite important. They talk about the protection of personal belongings. People were not to be stolen. Belongings were not to be stolen. Other people's possessions were not to be damaged. Whether you did that inadvertently by a fire breaking out from your property or by borrowing something and failing to look after it. And if you got these things wrong, well, you were to compensate, remunerate, pay back what was stolen or damaged, and pay more on top. For example, Exodus 22, verse 1, whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. And undergirding these laws is an important principle. Personal property matters. It matters what you do with other people's belongings. And here is why. Because although all things belong to God, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord and everything in it, God has given us, as human beings, possessions to own, and material possessions. He's entrusted us with many things. He's dignified us by giving us ownership of many things things. And so to steal, to take something unlawfully without permission from someone else is actually a violation of their dignity. It is to assault the freedom and dignity of another human being. And that is why theft is outlawed, because personal property matters. Consider the process of writing your name on something you own. And maybe a book or a notepad or a label on your phone. You're saying that this belongs to you. Now think back to primary school where perhaps your name was stitched onto your school uniform or school PE kit or school bag. And that personal label is significant. You're saying this item is mine and no one else's. This item has been claimed. It's not neutral. It's not unowned. There's even a sense in which this item then becomes something of an extension of you. It can only be understood in reference to you. It's yours. It's bound up with you. And it has your name on it, whether literally or not. And therefore, for someone to steal it or damage it is to offend you because it has your name on it. It's an affront to your dignity and your freedom. Personal property matters. I remember as a teenager being um, quite into buying cheap foreign football shirts. And my parents would take us on these adventurous foreign holidays on the cheap. We drove everywhere and always asked for a free accommodation. And we visited a number of beautiful European cities. uh, Paris, Madrid, Berlin, Barcelona, Rome and so on. But as a teenager, I wasn't that interested in the art galleries or the architecture. That didn't really do it for me. No, for me, it was the foreign fake football shirt market. 
That really was what grabbed my attention. Now, all legal, I should say. My first ever purchase was when I was about 13 years old, and it was a Juventus football shirt. They were a football team from Turin, black and white stripes, on the back, number 10, Del Piero. And there it was, my first foreign football shirt. But I remember years later, uh, lending this shirt to a friend and never getting it back. That was it. Gone. Forever. He never returned it. I don't know what happened to it. This may sound a bit strange, perhaps embarrassing, but over the years I've actually thought about that shirt quite a few times and thought, hmm, I really would like that back. That was mine. And it's gone. And of course, in one sense, that doesn't matter at all. Um, it's just a football shirt. If I had it, I wouldn't think twice about it. And yet there was something wrong about that. On a much more serious note, my father-in-law was burgled a few years ago. And I remember him saying that he felt violated. His home was unlawfully entered, his possessions damaged and stolen. It was a terrible thing. Intentional, shameful, and a personal affront to him because personal property matters. That's the first thing. Here's the second. We ought to trust God to provide for all our needs. When we think about theft, it's worth asking the question, where does the desire to steal and take come from? And I guess there are a number of motivations, perhaps laziness or excitement, lawlessness, peer pressure, opportunity, greed, habit. But for the Christian, surely at heart, it is an act of unbelief and distrust. I think back to Exodus chapter 16, where God provided manna in the desert for his people to eat. Manna were these, this, this um, honey-flavored wafer, uh, and they were there on the ground every day. Every morning, God's people were to go and collect it and eat it, except for the Sabbath. That was the day of rest. But on the Sabbath, what happened repeatedly was that some people just couldn't help themselves. They went and took the food. They stole it. They disobeyed God. And he was angry because this wasn't just about breaking a law. It was actually personal. It was a refusal to trust God to provide for their needs. A refusal to trust him enough to rest. And you see, this very problem is actually deep-rooted in every human heart. Distrust. It is a sad mark of the fall. We trust people we shouldn't trust, and we distrust people we should. Um, think of the child learning to jump from the stairs into the arms of their mum or dad. Uh, you may well have experienced this. In my experience, they, they, they want to jump, and you catch them. And then what they want to do is climb up the next step higher and jump again and then higher and jump again. And, and as they jump, they, they're basically completely flinging themselves into the air um, in, with, with a huge grin on their face. And there's no sense in which they ask the question, well, you know, w will my mum or dad really trust me? They'll catch me. Can I really trust them? Are they able to do it? None of those questions occur to them at all, they just fling themselves. It's a really beautiful picture of a natural trust. And you know, that's how it should be with us and God. As human beings, we were made to trust God just as children are made to trust their parents. We ought to trust God. It is human to trust God, to fling ourselves into his arms because he made us. And he knows us, and he loves us, and he is trustworthy. And yet so often our experience is that we fail to trust that he will really look after us. We find ourselves discontent with life, greedy for more. When it comes to material things, what happens is that our wants become needs. Our friends, rivals, money and possessions, idols. We're eager for more, driven by a need for more, willing to do anything for more. And yet the Bible warns us in this whole area, we need to be so careful. 
And money and possessions are good and necessary. It is good to have money. It is necessary to have money. It is good to have possessions. It is good to enjoy them. Paul says that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And yet, Jesus warns us. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Uh, The Apostle Paul warns the rich against putting their hope in wealth. And so we need to guard our hearts from the love of money. Remembering the reality The material possessions do not satisfy the heart's desires. They feed the heart's desires. Remembering the reality that if we are Christian, then God is our father, our shepherd, our king. Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, what you wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? And so here is the glorious truth. If we are Christians, we can say, in God, I have everything I need, and he will give me all that I need. We ought to trust God to provide for all our needs. Third, we ought to be generous with what we have. I wonder how you'd answer this question, how much money should a Christian own? Of course, the answer is that there is no answer because the Bible doesn't tell us Christians will have differing amounts of money. But what the Bible does explicitly commend is that regardless of how much we have, we ought to be generous with what we have. Money is not there to be stored up. It's there to be used. And here's the key principle, generosity. Uh, We are now um, three weeks from Easter, uh, three weeks from Easter Sunday, two weeks from Palm Sunday, and Holy Week, the week, the last week of Jesus' life. Think back to that week where we are told so much in the Gospels. It's really striking that there are two particular women that Jesus commends in that week. Two women commended for their generosity. One who gave from her luxury, Mary, who anointed Jesus with expensive perfume. Such extravagance, people were utterly shocked. And then also, another who gave from her poverty, the old woman at the temple who put in those two coins in the temple offering. They were so different, their gifts so different. But in both cases, It was the heart of generosity that Jesus commended. Because to him, generosity is a beautiful thing. In fact, this is one of the key motivations that the Apostle Paul gives Christians for not stealing. Ephesians 4, 28, he says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Now that is a really fascinating verse, because in it, we are given a very down-to-earth and significant motivation for working hard. We should work hard in order to share with those in need. Primarily, when we think about work, we shouldn't be thinking about ourselves, career, reputation, fulfillment. No, we're given a much more basic motivation. We ought to work for the sake of others to be able to provide and share. Of course, there are many people to provide for. We ought to provide for our families. That's our first responsibility. We ought to provide for the church, to enable gospel workers to do their work. We ought to provide for the spread of the gospel, investing in eternal reward. We ought to provide for those most in need, especially among the family of believers. And with this concept of generosity, we come full circle because generosity is the opposite of theft. Theft is taking from others for myself. Generosity is about serving others at my own expense. Can you see they are polar opposites? Theft is the mark of unbelief, generosity the mark of faith. 
And if we this morning understand something of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, then that will make us generous people. If we understand something of the astonishing love of Jesus Christ, of God in Jesus Christ, that will make us generous people. Here's how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And that is a mind blowing reality. Jesus had everything. He was rich. He enjoyed the glory and joy and love and fellowship with God in heaven. Life in the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And yet although he was God, he emptied himself. He became poor. He made himself nothing. He took on humanity and he embraced the agony, humiliation, horror of the cross. What he did was he took on our sin in his body, suffering our punishment, the wrath of a holy God, that we by faith might be restored to fellowship and friendship with the God who made us, that we might be crowned with love and honour and glory, that we might experience the love of God, that we might know true riches. And if we believe that, if we grasp something of that, something of the lavish generosity of God, then we will want to share the mindset of Christ. We, we won't be able to take from people because we will want to give to people. There's a wonderful picture of this in, in Acts chapter 2. We're told that the early church in Jerusalem was a church where some Christians sold their property and possessions to give to those in need. Now, this wasn't forced communism, or the negation of private ownership. It was grace-filled generosity, the voluntary sharing of personal possessions out of a heart of love for brothers and sisters, a beautiful example of generosity. And this really is the best antidote to a heart prone to greed. It's the positive outworking of the do not steal commandment. American pastor Kent Hughes puts it like this. He says, perpetual generosity is a perpetual de-deification of money. That is, every time we are generous with what we have, we are putting a nail in the coffin of greed. And that is the Christian way. Not to be tight-fisted takers, but generous givers. Not serving ourselves, but others. We ought to be generous with what we have. So we've seen three truths. Personal property matters. We ought to trust God to provide for all our needs. We ought to be generous with what we have. Let me ask three questions to help us think about these things. First, are we taking without permission what does not belong to us? I remember last year watching on Netflix the two-part drama, The Great Train Robbery. Uh, part one was exhilarating as you met the, the men who concocted the plan to rob the train and you saw them uh, carefully bring the plan to fruition. It was gripping stuff. Part two was very depressing as you saw each man get caught and sent to jail. It all seemed so pointless. But the danger for us is that we limit theft to that kind of thing. Robbery, burglary, shoplifting. But of course, actually, there's a lot more going on. It is taking without permission anything that does not belong to us or damaging someone else's property. And when you think of it like that, suddenly you realize there's a whole lot of theft that goes on in our culture all the time. Now we live in a culture of theft. Let me give you some examples. Now using someone else's Wi-Fi without permission, online piracy, streaming, downloading music, movies that you haven't paid for, Refusing to pay for a TV license or parking. Calling in sick when, really, we could work. Working fewer hours than contracted, wasting working hours. 
taking work equipment that's not ours, claiming illegitimate expenses, borrowing without returning, damaging someone else's property without fixing it or replacing it, tax evasion, receiving cash on goods to avoid paying tax, sex slavery, human trafficking, selling defective goods, pressurizing customers to purchase without reflection items they don't really need, the national lottery, stealing from the vulnerable, ruining people's lives, cheating employees of their wages, charging excessive interest, insurance fraud, plagiarism, finding something on the pavement and taking it, scratching someone's car and driving off, identity theft. And the point is there are just many, many ways in which we might break this commandment. Now, some examples will feel to us fairly harmless and some more severe, yet they are all examples of theft. And what we see is that fallen humanity is ingenious at finding ways to steal. I remember when we first moved to Southampton a few years ago, asking someone a fairly unclearly put question about bike theft. I said something like, is Southampton any good when it comes to stealing bikes? <laughs> this man looked at me quizzically and said, yes, people are very good at stealing bikes in Southampton. And the reality is that all of us, each of us, will be prone to theft and to justifying it. And we say, well, it's not, it's not really stealing. After all, it's only a big business. They've got loads of money. They don't really need it. No one will notice. Everyone does it. It's no big deal. But of course, that's not the Christian way. We ought to ask ourselves with a tender heart, are we breaking this commandment? Romans 13, 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Are we taking, without permission, what does not belong to us? Second, are we trusting God to provide for all our needs? Psalm 23 is a favourite psalm of many Christians. And it starts with those wonderful words, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I wonder, do you know this for yourself? Do you know God as your shepherd? Do you know that you lack nothing? If you're not a Christian, this is a glorious invitation. Imagine that. Knowing God as your shepherd, through Jesus, knowing him as your saviour and your father. It is an invitation to leave behind a life of self-sufficiency, to know the forgiveness and the embrace and the love of God. Jesus died that we might come to experience that, and that is the invitation to you. But if we are Christians, it's not then that we don't need to work hard or take responsibility. Now, of course, God uses means, as we saw in the fourth commandment, six days work, one day rest. But it does mean we are free from despair because we have everything that we need. God is looking after us to provide for everything that we need. And we can rest in God. And God gives us a community, a church, a family, people to care for us and share with us. I wonder, are you trusting God to provide for all your needs? Third, are we being generous with what we have? One of my favourite board games, I may have told you before, is the classic game Monopoly. Now, for some reason, I really enjoy this, despite the fact that when we played this game at home, it leads to chaos, tears, shouting, fighting, storming off, and general carnage. I still believe in this game, partly because I like to win, <laughs> partly because I just like the idea of having lots of money and owning hotels, and partly because it does provide a wonderful illustration. However much money you have, at the end of the game, 
You have to put it all back in the box. What you have is yours on loan. And that's very helpful because that's what real money is like. Uh, the rich Egyptians may have put their money and possessions in their tombs in hope for the afterlife, but they're just still there in the tombs. They never traveled with them. They rotted in the ground. You can't take your money with you. There's no such thing as a forever home here on earth. Money and possessions are just short term. And so although personal property does matter, we must not cling on to it as if it is ours forever. No, all that we have is a gift of God given to us on loan for our short lives to be used for good. I wonder if it might be helpful for us to mentally relabel what we own. Perhaps even write, God's, given to me on loan for the moment to be used for good. And if we did that, I wonder what difference it would make to us. Would we be more willing to share than we are? Would we be less stingy and more generous? Are you being generous with what you have? Generous with your time? Generous with your money? Generous with your home, your possessions, your gifts, your lives? Do we give off our best or do we just give off the dregs? Because really this, these questions, this whole issue, is actually just a microcosm of the Christian life. The whole Christian life is the call to self-emptying in the service of others. We're not to be takers but sharers, not stealers but givers, not serving ourselves but others. As Jesus puts it, storing up treasure in heaven, seeking eternal reward and the truth is that this kind of life is costly it's risky it might even be exhausting but according to Jesus it is wise it is good it is pleasing to God when we give of ourselves for the sake of others it brings a smile to the face of God it is a beautiful way to live because it is the life of love, the life like God's. Let me pray for us. Our Father, we confess as we think about this topic that it does expose many sins in our hearts. We confess that so often we are self-serving and un believing and yet we thank you that you are the God who is generous abundantly generous and you have given us your son and you've given us your spirit we thank you that Jesus was willing to give up the glory of heaven to embrace the agony of the cross that we might be called your children we pray that we might know that for ourselves and that that glorious reality would shape our lives. We long to be generous people. We long to be trusting people. We long to be a generous church. We long to be a trusting church. Help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.